PAL World. What is there to say about this game that hasn't already been said? In its first month on the market, PAL World has quickly become, in no uncertain terms, a global phenomenon. And that's not something I say lightly. For those who don't know, PAL World is an experience created by Pocket Pair, a team of Japanese game developers who pretty much solely create works that draw overt and rather heavy-handed inspiration from other titles. Make no mistake though, while I can't speak for any of their other games, this approach does not dilute the PAL World experience, which combines the best parts of gameplay from Ark Survival Evolved with the fun and whimsical character styling so indicative of Pokémon, all while adding its own innovative and unique gameplay aspects to the mix. Although it may not seem so at first glance, PAL World is a legitimately creative experience in spite of itself, quickly becoming the title with the second highest all-time peak concurrent player base on Steam, not just for the year, not just for the last five years, but of all time, with only PUBG occupying a higher all-time standing as of the time of recording. Recently, I've been really enjoying PAL World myself. Pretty much everything about the experience, from the gameplay to the visual design to the abundant glitches and speedrunning potential, have been really fun for me to explore. But as always, with a new IP, I've also been on the hunt to uncover PAL World's lore. What some players may not have considered is that, contrary to its rather derivative nature, PAL World does have its own story to tell, and it's actually a more extensive and interesting one than I think a lot of people may give it credit for on a surface level. That's why today, I want to talk a little bit about the lore of this game, and clue you into some of the events going on around you throughout your time playing. Hopefully, not only can I offer you some insight into the story of the game, but also point out some areas of the experience that you may want to pay attention to as the game continues to evolve throughout and even beyond its early access phase. So with that being said, I hope that you'll join me today as we explore the full lore of the game of PAL World. Let's start in the beginning. This is a map of the Palpagos Islands, a small, intimately connected archipelago that's never been recorded in any of the world's charts, maps, or history books. For as long as anyone can remember, the Palpagos Islands have remained completely hidden from the outside world, owing to a thick fog which seems to perpetually enshroud the surrounding sea. The precise source of the fog remains a mystery even to this day. Some, including the Castaway, a character whose many writings allude to a lot of the fundamental principles at play in the Palpagos Islands, speculates that the fog may even be intentional. It was actually because of the fog that the castaway first became deserted on Palpagos at all, sometime in the recent past, after they first set out on an expedition to explore a conspicuously empty area of the world's oceans. In their second chronological piece of writing, titled Castaway's Journal Day Zero, they recount, strangely enough, the island is shrouded in a thick fog that makes discerning it from the sea impossible. Attempting to steer away from the fog, I turned rudder, only to be enveloped in an even deeper fog. Just then, someone attacked me. I have no idea where the attack came from, but my boat was all but destroyed. With nothing but wreckage left, I was still somehow able to make it to the coast. This island exists in no database. It is an island hidden from the world. Why is it being hidden? Why isn't it on any maps? I'm certain this is all intentional. Was that attack on my vessel part of this attempt at complete concealment? Perhaps we'll get a definitive answer in future patches or additions to the game. Interestingly though, despite the fog, it does seem that some information about Palpagos has reached the outside world, perhaps signifying that although anyone approaching is bound to become stranded, it may not be completely impossible to leave again given proper equipment. The cowardly islander, found in the Sea Breeze archipelago, puts it rather bluntly when they say that some people do in fact come from the outside world specifically searching for pals, which undoubtedly are the island's most unique and characteristic feature. Pals, a name also coined by the castaway, are a race of creatures seen nowhere else in the world except on Palpagos. These creatures, although varying greatly in size, shape, and demeanor, display a variety of collective traits that link them together. The first is that the life cycle of a pal appears altogether distinct from any other sort of biotic life discovered before or since. For example, Pals do not engage in traditional means of reproduction. Instead, when a male and a female pal breed, an egg will simply manifest in their 
proximity after a short time. In addition, when a pal dies, its remains do not decompose, as can be said of other beings. Instead, the body disappears after a short time by means which are still beyond scientific explanation. Aside from these discrepancies, though, pals as a general collective live their lives almost identically to any other being, and exist in as wide a variety of habitats as other life on Earth does. There is one other aspect of Palpagos, though, which seems to share a unique and intimate link with pals as individual life forms, and that's the existence of the impossibly large tree which sits just off of the island's northern coast. As of today, nobody seems to possess definitive knowledge regarding the tree's presence or its significance to the islands, though the castaway does offer their own theory in journal number six. There's something odd that's bothered me since I arrived here. Far off in the distance, I can see what looks like an enormous tree, big enough to be the so-called world tree spoken of in so many myths. Still, it's so large that no amount of fog would be enough to obscure it from view from outside the island. The only hypothesis I can come up with is that something other than the fog enveloping the island prevents it from being seen by the outside world. In other words, some kind of mechanism must be preventing it from being seen from the outside. It seems likely that the mysterious powers these pals have has something to do with them. For untold centuries, this seems to have been how Palkind survived, cloistered away from the rest of the world on the Palpagos Islands, never to make contact with the civilizations developing on faraway shores. But it's thought that sometime in the distant past, all of that would have changed around the time of our oldest architectural records of presumed human contact. From a time that likely predates even the mysterious fog, the evidence of an ancient civilization in Palpagos is found in a number of places throughout the game. In particular, in particular, the Castaways journals make mention of three distinct types of structures that they attribute to the group. The first are the various stone ruins which can be found around the islands, and which take several forms. These constructions vary widely in size, ranging from these chunks of decaying brickwork to spires embedded in the ground, all the way up to what appears to be a full castle town set just north of Mount Obsidian. The second set of structures recognized by the Castaway are the five towers that appear in various locations throughout the island. Island, but which admittedly are composed of a visual style that is almost incomparable to the other ruins, leading to the assumption that the ancient civilization either was once, or is still, a presence on Palpagos that developed over a very long period of time, and made several technological advancements along the way. It was probably in the same era as the tower's respective constructions, where technologies such as the tablet-like device which contains the Paldex would have first originated. Such constructions may also be connected to these odd cuboid structures that we see in other areas of the map. The final piece of architecture attributed to the ancient civilization, though, are statues like this that exist at various points throughout the map. This one in particular was observed by the castaway, who wrote of it, I am nearly certain it is a legacy of the ancient civilization, but why would humans build a statue such as this? Everything I've found thus far has suggested that pals lived alongside these ancients as equals, but constructing a monument like this must mean some were also objects of worship. Perhaps there are certain pals out there that have a special significance, both to people and to pals. With a little bit of deduction and exploration around the island, it's actually not difficult to discover that what the castaway says here is very likely the truth. Although I put it at the beginning of this video, I'm going to once again air a spoiler warning here, as what I'm about to discuss next very much pertains to late game content. In fact, it's some of the latest content that Palworld has to offer at this point, and that is the existence and significance of the legendary pals, as depicted by this this statue and many of the others seen throughout the game. There are four special pals located in extremely difficult to access areas, all of which can be found at max level 50, and which possess a special trait called legendary, which supplies a fairly generous boost to the three stats seen here. These are the rarest and generally the most difficult to acquire pals in the entire game, and thus they occupy the final four slots of the pal decks. Their legendary status doesn't just apply to gameplay alone though as it seems that many or all of the legendary pals were, and in a sense still are, considered nearly deific in nature. The pal depicted in the statue observed by the castaway can be identified as number 111, Jetragon, a legendary creature of immense speed whose paldex entry alludes to its nearly biblical significance. Watches over Palpagos Island from high above. When calamity returns to the land, the earth will split open and the skies will burn. It is destined to strike down the calamity in a flash of total destruction. 
It's also the fastest PAL in the entire game by a large margin, so I think it's no wonder that the Ancients took to Jet Dragon in particular. But this PAL isn't alone. A creature that is in many ways equal and opposite to Jet Dragon is the PAL which directly precedes it in the PAL decks, numbered 110, Frostalian, whose PAL deck entry reads, Guardian Deity of Palpagos Island, known as the Winter Caller. In the past, when a calamity struck the land, it soared into the sky and sealed away the threat by casting the island into an eternal winter. In many ways, Frostalian's parallels to Jet Dragon write themselves. Both pals are concerned with some sort of prophesized doom, with Frostalian having apparently already fulfilled its role of combating such calamity at some point in the past, while Jet Dragon has yet to do so later in time. Another similarity, though, is that the ancient civilization also created a statue of this being, located in the Frostborn Mountains. There are many more statues and architectural elements found within Pal World that we could discuss in this video, but for now I'm only going to focus on one more design to round out the collection of works depicting legendary Pals, with that design in question being this one, which can be found at the Bridge of the Twin Knights, and in some other places throughout the map. This duo of monumental carvings depicts the pair of legendary Pals Palladius and Necromus, who are said to have once been one in the same within their respective Paldex entries, but now seem to serve as the embodiment of duality between good and evil, dark and light. That's kind of the extent of what we know about the ancient civilization, though, and really of this whole period between humans first arriving on Palpagos and the modern day in general. It's very possible, if not plausible, that other relics such as the Anubis statues and Lif Monk effigies may be products of the ancient civilization as well, but these artifacts demand more research, and I plan to cover them much more closely in a future video, so I guess subscribe if you want to see something like that. For now, though, we can turn our attention to the climate of the islands in the modern day, where disparate pockets of civilization have begun to crop up. The present structure of human society here is seemingly pretty disconnected, or at least more disconnected than it may have once been, with people living in settlements of nominal size, if and where those settlements crop up at all. Presently, Dune Shelter seems to boast the largest and most established city, but even then, its size and population seem pretty unremarkable relative to our own world. So, in an environment such as this, perhaps it's no surprise that many islanders have chosen to align with various different factions ranging in size, territory, attitude, ambitions, and ruthlessness. One of the most storied of these factions in the modern day is likely the Rain Syndicate, a group that you'll likely encounter quite often when exploring the majority of the game. Within the Castaways journals, the Rain Syndicate is insinuated to potentially be modern descendants of the ancient civilization, though they're certainly not the only faction to boast this potential tie. More specifically, in the Castaways Journal Day 10, they write, Today I decided to take my pals on a bit of an excursion. A tower-like object, visible in the distance, had piqued my curiosity. After walking a while, I encountered another human. When I tried to talk to them, however, they didn't say a word and just pointed a gun at me. Since they're on the island, it would make sense to consider them a remnant of the ancient civilization, but their attire suggests they're likely from the same era as I am. Are they just like me, from the outside, or has this ancient civilization developed here of its own accord. While the precise answers to these questions remain unclear, we actually possess a rather large amount of information pertaining to the modern-day syndicate thanks to their leader, Zoe Rain. Like each of the major faction leaders found throughout the game, Zoe can be encountered as a boss, found within one of the tower structures we talked about earlier. Each faction has come to control a different tower by the time the game takes place, and furthermore, each boss has a selection of their own personal journal entries with which allow further insight into their respective organizations and allow for a variety of different perspectives into life on Palpagos. In her very first journal entry, Zoe explains her general situation and that of the Syndicate. I don't have a family. My father disappeared a long time ago, and I've never seen my mother's face. The only ones who raised me are those guys and Grisbolt. That's why I know I have no choice but to survive in this tiny little world. Those guys all chase around pals with their guns. They capture the ones they hurt and sell them to these other weird guys. In return, they get food. They even share it with me. That's why I don't have to be hungry. I don't think any of those guys really care about me. They just keep me alive because I'm the daughter of one of their bosses. I still believe that, even if I'm a boss now, too. 
In essence, the primary function of the Rain Syndicate seems to be acting as suppliers for pal poachers, likely selling their collected pals to the Dark Marketeer, who's a character that we ourselves can meet in several different locations around the game world, and who will be more than happy to engage in the buying and selling of dubiously obtained pals. Though Zoe doesn't explicitly say which of her parents was one of the leaders of the Syndicate before their departure, I think it's safe to assume it was likely her father, not only because he's the the only parent Zoe herself has ever met, but also because it makes the most sense to have had the Rain family name inherited from him. This generational aspect of the Syndicate also lends further credence to the idea that they may have been an established force on Palpagos for a long time. Perhaps even more iconic than Zoe herself, though, is her companion, Grisbolt, a massive and imposing electric-type pal that will likely serve as players' first big skill check in the game. It's said that these two first met one another as part of usual syndicate business, the gang having captured Grisbolt potentially as part of a daring poaching run to Wildlife Sanctuary 1, which is the only area in the game where pals of the Grisbolt species can be legitimately obtained. Grisbolt was one of the pals they were going to cell, but she looked so lonely in her cage. She was just like me, and father, I thought. I was still little back then, so I couldn't control myself. I waited until everybody was sleeping, opened Grisbolt's cage, and ran off far away with her. I shared half a slice of my breakfast toast with her, but we were both hungry by evening and went back to the base. Of course, all the guys were super angry. They threw me in a cage with Grisbolt, and I thought we were going to get taken away. But Grisbolt protected me. Not even their guns or bats could beat her. How did she get captured in the first place if she's that strong? I bet she didn't even try to escape, the big dummy. I gave Grisbolt a command, and she called down a big bolt of lightning that wiped out all the guys. They didn't wake up until the next morning. Ever since then, I've been with Grisbolt. Subsequent entries allude to Zoe's wish to understand what's beyond the sea, her confusion about why she's always supposed to be guarding the Rain Syndicate Tower, which apparently possesses a deep and innate power that is somehow significant, and a log which details the age-old conflict between the Syndicate and our next group of interest, the Free Pal Alliance. Also known by their abbreviated name, the FPA, this is another group that controls one of the five towers, this time being the one in the Frostbound Mountains, as well as a large swath of the surrounding area. And unlike the Rain Syndicate, their links to the ancient civilization are much more pronounced. The Free Pal Alliance is headed by Lily Everhart, a woman whose first journal entry, I think, alludes to the mission statement of the group better than I ever could. Pals. Such strange creatures. These noble beings have upheld our civilization since ancient times. They not only boast impressive intellect, reflexes, and adaptability, but are adorable to look at as well. How could anyone not come to love them? Humans are savage animals. With an insatiable appetite for the proliferation of their own kind, they subjugate other species and enslave them. They engage in pointless strife, consume flesh for no reason, and develop beyond their needs. When one takes into account their hideous appearance, how could anyone not detest them? Humans capture pals and use them. If a pal is confined to a so-called pal sphere, they become obedient to their master. What abhorrent tools they become. One can only say this is the greatest stain in the history of our civilization. Pals and humans were originally meant to live alongside each other, in mutual support, not a relationship between master and servant, but one of equals, a harmonious coexistence, if you will. Eating a pal for food is akin to blasphemy against God. So, yes indeed, the Free Pal Alliance purportedly exists to uphold the interests of pal kind in spite of the growing human population on Palpagos. They kind of exist in opposition to the Syndicate and their associated groups, like poachers, who see pals as vehicles for profit and exploitation. Although the FPA does not believe in the use of pal spheres due to their alleged pacifying effect, this isn't to say that the organization is opposed to human-pal cooperation, as was outlined in Lily's manifesto earlier. In fact, it was such cooperation to begin with that caused her to team up with Liline, a pal which she describes meeting after saving a different pal resembling a vivid lily flower from a group of poachers, at which point she returned to her base to find Liline waiting for her. That being said, while Lily certainly seems to uphold the fundamental values of her organization, not everyone else in the group seems as strictly opposed to moral concessions, at least not in the service of a greater good. Lily's final journal entry is a particularly interesting one, as it highlights an intriguing moral dilemma not really seen any
anywhere else in the game. It reads, On some distant shore of the island, there exists an islet where certain pals live. Not a single one of their kind, strange as it may seem, resides on the main island. Perhaps they can only flourish in a particular kind of environment, or their natural predators roam the main island. Then again, perhaps they are simply unable to cross the sea. I do not know the reason they exist there, but I am certain that they must be protected. Just imagining those poachers setting up a hideout there and ruining their way of life is enough to make my blood seethe. With every visitor from the outside to their island, the pals' numbers dwindle. At this rate, they may even go extinct. I would like nothing more than for us to protect them, but we have our hands full guarding this forest. As loathed as I am to ask for help, I have petitioned the PIDF to assist with their protection. In return, we must pay them a hefty sum, but it is worth it if it means protecting the lives of precious pals. It seems my subordinates have found a way to generate revenue. I will set aside those funds for this endeavor. It seems odd that they would be able to gather such large sums only through raids on the poachers' camps, though. So, yeah, if you've ever stumbled across an FPA encampment with a big cage in the middle containing a pal, sort of like what can be observed of the Rain Syndicate, well, chances are good that behind their leader's back, Alliance members are generating the cash needed to protect the various nature preserves found throughout Palpagos by engaging in a bit of secretive pal capturing for themselves. I personally find this to be a really interesting dilemma. Although I think we can all guess how Lily would react if this information were brought to light, these actions do kind of make sense from a pragmatic perspective. The hunting and capturing of pals on the main island is not generally considered a crime, except by the FPA themselves, and we know that a number of the pals here are far greater in abundance than most found on the preserves. So, even though this is a breach of the Free Pal Alliance creed, it's not difficult to see why some members may see this option as the lesser of two evils, so to speak. There's there's another group that Lily mentions here too, though. The same group, in fact, who was hired to protect the preserves in the first place and that is the Palpagos Islands Defense Force, or PIDF, which is a private military group that serves as the closest thing to a police force that the islands have to offer. PIDF agents can be found pretty much anywhere that there's people. There's at least one guard at every major settlement in the game, and they're easily recognizable by their armored uniforms, which are somewhat unique on the island. Though, what we'll find when looking into their leader, Marcus Dryden, is that the PIDF's means of generating revenue run a lot deeper than simple defense-for-hire contracts. In reality, a considerably higher amount of income comes from corruption and exploitation of others through the drug trade. Marcus himself explains as much in his first diary entry. PIDF doesn't belong in a place like this. The guys I arrested today couldn't even pay the fine. Guess it's to be expected if they spend all their money getting a fix, but they can't even imagine that the money they pay ends up lining my pockets. I make a profit when they buy, and then I make more when I arrest them for possession and I even get back my product to sell again when I confiscate what they have. It's a grand scheme. They're idiots, and I'm a genius. This is just their punishment for being fools, understand? This island is just my little sandbox to play on. For all I care, they can live their little sad lives without ever knowing I'm the one supplying their fix and the one controlling it. If I let them get carried away, they'll just go off demanding rights that ain't fit for garbage like them. That's right. The man that serves as the effective police chief of the Palpagos Islands is actually dealing on the side. He says it all in that first entry. He's generating massive profit off of those he can get hooked, and even the intro animation that plays before his boss battle in the tower he controls, found in the desiccated desert, shows him throwing out a bunch of bills just to accentuate his love for money. He's also the first and only faction boss to have a companion pal that he rather overtly mistreats. Life out here is not all peace and quiet. The damn wind blows and somehow somebody's cutting into my profits. Just today, some punk little syndicate clown who thinks he's smart tried selling stims without my permission. My partner, Phalaris, is always there to deal with dumb bottom feeders like that. Just like me, he's having fun playing in this little sandbox. Or maybe he just likes eating that white stuff. Huh? Don't look at me like that. Ain't no food today, boy. Go eat some of that white sand. He feeds his bird coke. Uh, that's the lore. His third and final journal entry says as much too, but I'm not going to belabor the point any longer. I think you get it. Just steer clear of Dryden and the PIDF. They're not good guys. 
Our fourth and penultimate group in today's video is up next, the PAL Genetic Research Unit. Similarly to the Free PAL Alliance, the name of this one kinda says it all. Based out of the Astral Mountains Tower, the main concern of this faction is all manner of experimentation on PALs through means of questionable humanity. They have hopes of both enhancing the abilities of existing PALs, and more enduringly, have sought to create an entire new species of PAL for themselves. The leader of the group, Victor Ashford, has recorded a small selection Collection of the experimentation within his diary entries, most interestingly of which is the final work, which closely details a breakthrough in the interspecies PAL experiments mentioned previously. Results? Success. Only one specimen emerged, an artificially created new species with four legs and wings. It was promptly transferred to the cultivation equipment, and has since shown promising progress, steadily maturing. Attempts to reproduce the same process failed. Thus, this miraculous success is attributed to some unknown external factor. Impressions. The success of the experiment is genuinely gratifying. The new species, named Shadowbeak, will continue to be observed closely for further developments. However, the lack of reproducibility of the procedure poses a significant challenge. Henceforth, the plan is to proceed with the experiment, incorporating slight adjustments based on this procedure. Indeed, what is very likely the original Shadowbeak is the very same PAL which accompanies Victor when battled in his tower. But it seems that since this log was written, the genetic research unit has made further breakthroughs into replicating the process which led to its creation, since instances of Shadowbeak can also be observed on wildlife Sanctuary 3, along with every other boss pal species with the exception of Grisbolt. This last log also includes an addendum though, which reads simply, the disappearance of Alex, who served as a lab assistant, is concerning. And with that, we're on to the last of Pal World's major factions, the Brothers of the Eternal Pyre, who make their home in and around the tower located on Mount Obsidian, and who are probably the most mysterious of Palpagos' groups. There's really not much known about this faction whatsoever outside of speculation that perhaps they worship or otherwise revere Mount Obsidian itself in some way. It seems likely that they're a religious order, and perhaps they could even be described as a doomsday cult of some kind, considering the title attributed to one of their higher level raiding parties. Unfortunately, looking to their boss, Axel Traverse, offers similarly little in terms of elaboration. It has been speculated though that perhaps Axel is actually Alex, the researcher mentioned earlier, who seems to have deserted the PAL genetic research unit during or shortly after the creation of the original Shadowbeak, though this rumor has yet to be confirmed. That's all of the meaning that I actually feel comfortable highlighting and conveying to you within this video, as anything else I could offer runs a risk of being sort of baseless, and I don't want to get into my own theories within this upload too much. So instead, why don't I read to you the only diary entry Axel Traverse has in the game. In fact, it's actually the last log altogether. Like all of the other logs thus far, I've modified absolutely nothing from the original text, and what you're going to see on screen and hear me say is exactly what is written in the game. Are you ready for this? Every day I'm snoring, no rivals to get me going. I don't care about they type, ain't nobody gonna beat my hype. I'm looking for a fight, a real tough brother from another mother. Throwing in the towel ain't gonna cut it. It's gotta be a knockout, a throwdown brawl out. So fast your eyes'll bleed. When we ready for the battle, you better believe the shock's going to rock your socks off. Sawed off, my lightning is tougher than high kings. When it hits the ring, ain't nobody gonna be singing for you, playa. You ready for this hype? You read the words, so get ready for the fight. Truly, Axel Traverse has some mad bars, and I apologize that I delivered them in the blandest way imaginable. Truth be told, I actually really did try and find a tempo and rap these the first few times that I recorded this script, but frankly, half the lines just don't rhyme. And then you have these weird little interjections like sawed off just put in here for no reason. It's like it's Eminem or something. Aside from the big five, there's also a fair number of smaller, unnamed, or dubiously connected groups or organizations, such as groups of mercenaries and wandering merchants. And there's also the Poachers, an underground criminal cabal likely centered around the Dark Marketeer, that seem to have no problem exploiting, maiming, or straight up butchering pals for the sake of making a profit. It's easy to see this guy as perhaps the most overtly evil character in all of Palpagos, though everyone who plays will doubtlessly have a different perception of these guys depending on how they decide to treat their own pals. And ultimately, that leaves us with just one more character or set of characters to talk about. 
you, and anyone else you decide to start up a world and play with. Our player characters aren't ultimately that dissimilar to the castaway we talked about near the beginning of this video. We washed up here through unknown means, and ultimately, it's up to us to make of the Palpagos Islands what we want. The choice is yours, how you're going to treat the pals you encounter, and in a way, I think that pretty much everyone who gives Pal World a try will find themselves aligning with one of the five major groups in some way or another. Will you treat your pals with care like the FPA? Capture them to ensure your own survival like the Rain Syndicate? Exploit them for extreme personal gain like the PIDF? Try to orchestrate the perfect, optimized team like the Pal Genetic Research Unit? Or maybe you'll decide to just screw around on top of a volcano with all your buddies like the Brothers of the Eternal Pyre? <laughs> Whatever you choose, the Palpagos Islands are yours to explore, and I hope that armed with the knowledge of some of the lore that we've discussed today, you'll be able to enjoy your time here even more fully. Well, you've made it to the end of yet another video, and as always, I just want to say thank you for watching, and I hope that you learned something interesting today about the lore of Pal World. I seriously can't stress enough how much fun I've been having with this game. It's one of my favorites in recent years, and to me, it kind of just came out of nowhere, to be honest. I think I remember seeing an advertisement for it at the Game Awards in 2023, but I honestly can't remember. I really can't find enough good things to say about it. It really is just a great game. As always, if you liked this video and are interested in seeing more from me in the future, whether it be about Pal World or one of the many other IPs that I enjoy talking about, then hey, why not subscribe if you haven't done so already? I'd love to have you stick around, and as I hinted at earlier in the video, I already have another script in production for a future Pal World related video that I think you'll probably enjoy if you made it all the way to the end of this one. Aside from that though, that's gonna just about do it for me for today. Once again, I want to say thanks for watching, especially if you made it through all this stuff here at the end, and for now, this is Averberon, I'll see you again soon, and have a good one.